Hello, everybody. Today, I've got something a little bit different. The content is really not different, but this format is a little bit. Um, I crossed paths with a gentleman named Phil Kalis, who is an employee of Horween Leather Company. Horween is a sole supplier of Shell Cordovan leather for Allen Edmonds shoes um, and the only a company in the United States that produces shell cordovan leather. Uh, he also has his own business, Ashland Leather Company, where he produces things like shell cordovan wallets and watch straps. So he's a person to me on the industry inside. And we get into a very in-depth discussion. It's about over 40 minutes worth of discussion about shell cordovan, uh, the differences in different types of leather, like full grain versus corrected grain leather, what aniline leather is. And then also, uh, the tanning process and how to care for leather and how you moisturize it and how you clean it. So I think there's some really good stuff in here if you like the details. By the way, this is a recorded Skype conversation. Um, you know, there's interruptions and a battery died one time. So there's a couple interruptions in it and then an occasion the um, internet uh, bandwidth wasn't enough, you know, for whatever reason. So it's not a perfect recording, but Hopefully there's some uh, content here that really gives you some value. Hello everybody, it's Robert Powers. Four and a half out of five. My shoe collection. Some stains there. Get a nice lather. Here is the finished product. I'm not a professional. How tight this is though. A pair of Allen Edmonds torn apart. That to me is a proper mirror shine. So here it goes. And here they are finished up. Hello everybody, it's Robert Powers. Um, and today we're going to be discussing leather. Um, now, the person I have here, I'm very excited to be talking to via Skype here. Um, you know, uh, uh, he's a few hundred miles away, and um, he, I, I guess this is Phil Callis. I'll just let him introduce himself uh, and why he's a really good person for me to be talking about if we want to discuss the topic of leather, what makes good and bad leather, and how to care for it. Phil, why don't you, you know, say who you are, and remember, there's a lot of people out there who have never heard of Horween leather either. Oh, okay, great. Uh, well, Bob, it's a great to. I, I'm glad that we, the world, has brought us together, uh, and so it's awesome to. <laughs> it's awesome to talk to you. <laughs> Leather has brought us together, I should say. Yes. So, my name is Phil Kalis. I am a employee at Horween Leather Company. I've been working there since. Uh, gosh, 2006, and I own a little leather goods company named Ashland Leather, where we make that leather. Um, I make during the day at the tannery, I turn that into wallets and other small leather goods sort of at night around this time of day. <laughs> so right, uh, right. I'm a big nut for leather as it seems like uh, we share common interests in that. And I just think it's a great material. And I happen to just, me personally, I happen to love the longevity of leather and I love the way that uh, it ages over time. That's my big thing. Right. I like things that last and get better, which is actually on that note, there's not Absolutely. many things in the world that you can wear every day that actually get better every time you wear them. So that's why I think mm. leather is a particularly interesting material. So. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I had the great experience, and you guys may have seen, if not, I have a video, YouTube video on the Horween Leather Factory visit. Could you give us a you know a little bit of a synopsis of who Horween Leather Company is? Sure. Uh, sorry, uh, got a little bit of a slow connection here, but uh, Horween is a, an amazing um, place, actually. It, there's a factory, the leather tannery is lo located on the northwest side of Chicago. It's about three or four miles out north um, northwest of the city center, and they've been located on the northwest side there for since 1905. So it's been 113 years, which is absolutely insane to wow. think about. There's actually five generations of... Um, family members that have run the tann tannery since 1905. So it's a really incredible story, but it's also mm -hmm. amazing because the, uh, <laughs> the tannery has, has produced several products that have become renowned over time. So the most popular and probably, mm -hmm. actually the biggest known is actually football leather, but the original okay. and most popular leather was actually Shell Cordovan, which I'm assuming you're familiar with it. It's found in a lot of dress shoes. I it's am. a really mm -hmm. amazing leather with a beautiful uh, depth of color, but also a really glassy, shiny um, luster to it. And actually, the the leather, when it was first developed by the Germans, gosh, it's 1800s, they called it Spiegelware, and that actually meant uh, mirror goods. So it oh, was wow. leather that they thought looked like a mirror because of its bright, shiny luster. And the best part about Shell Cordovan is that it's, it tends to retain that bright luster over time. So I've seen people probably like yourself that have had shell cordovan pairs of footwear that they've had 
uh, for many, many years. I've actually have customers of mine that contact me telling me how they've worn their grandfather's shoes and all they have to wow. do is resole it. They just look better than wow. they, they did 50 years ago. So it's a really hey, amazing hey, product. Uh, just by the way, just for the audience out there, you know, Alan Edmonds, if you know my channel at all, you know I'm a huge Alan Edmonds fan, have a few pairs. The full new retail price on a pair of, let's say, Alan Edmonds Park Avenues in, in calfskin leather is right now, as of late 2018, $425. If you take that same exact design shoe and say, I want it in Shell Cordovan, yes, they put a different sole on it. That's an upgrade. It becomes, I think, is it six ninety five? dollars I think. I'm not familiar um, with Alan Edmonds pricing, but it's fair yeah, to say sure that the Cordovan is top price. It's their yeah, I'm pretty sure it's most six, expensive. Pretty sure it's six ninety five. So basically, adds you know like almost three hundred dollars to the cost. Um, and I saw the factory, uh, you know, the Horween factory I visited and saw how it's made. And it takes what between six to nine months to produce shell Cordovan from yeah, the that's hide, right. right? That's and correct. And I think there's only only two pieces about the size of a Thanksgiving serving tray. Uh, two pieces about that big per horse is all you get, right? That's correct. The, the Cordovan actually – oh, I have a piece right here. <laughs> nice. nice. I, have a va I have a Cordovan <laughs> valet tray. So this is actually about as big as they get. So I make these little valet trays, but this is something I took out of scrap mm -hmm. and made. But uh, roughly it's like this scrap. big, they're not okay. – they don't get much bigger than this. So that's – now. Could you show that, that stamp? Could you show that? Because that's iconic. To anybody that knows Alan Edmonds' shoes, the, the Shell Cordovan shoes come with that stamp on it. So it's like a little cult following thing, that, that right? That Horween stamp. Right. And yeah. I probably should have been better prepared because this is a reject shell that I... Oh, really? Because <laughs> you just don't get shells big enough to cut into a, a valet tray. So I just... Mm. And then the price I get for them is it doesn't make sense to make a valley tray out of cordovan, <laughs> but I did it just because I wanted to see what it looked like. That's cool. But the, the cool. shelf side is actually this black side. So what's actually happening here is there's a specific membrane in every hind quarter of a horse uh, mm -hmm. that's that we call the shell. And it's actually subcutaneous. It's underneath the skin. So part of the tannery's job of what they've done is we actually shave down to that dense fiber structure of the shell, and it it's actually tends to be really bright, shiny, and smooth. So it's very much different than every other leather around for that reason. And mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not, this is not leather grain, although it does have grain-like characteristics. This mm -hmm. is this is sort of a different world of leather. It's, uh, I don't really know how to describe it. Yeah, uh, sure. I know, you, you were saying that, um, so shell cord of it is different. So, uh, just to give you an idea, like you said, six to nine months to tan a piece of shell cordovan, and I can go into the details of that, but what's really interesting, mm -hmm. the, the result of that is, not only is it a small, roughly two square feet piece of leather, but the cost is roughly ten times that of wow. what side mm -hmm. leather is. So, cap, so the tiers are sort of uh, shell cordovan, then it's mm -hmm. like exotics. Uh, gators, oh, uh, wow. crocodile, and then it's calfskin, and then it's side leather, and none of those are bad. They're just different mm -hmm. and take more expertise to make or more time to make. So the problem is that um, it's too bad they're only two square feet each because it, it makes the price be ten times as much. So you're talking about a right. hundred dollars per square foot of leather wow. for the cordovan, and mm -hmm. roughly ten dollars a square foot for uh, like a chrome excel side leather that we make. So and here's most, a quick here's sure. a quick tip for the listeners out there. Cordovan, like if especially you're looking for shoes on eBay, eBay refers to a color like this burgundy-ish color. Shell cordovan is this material we're talking about. So don't be fooled. You'll see people on eBay selling shoes that are cordovan, and you know they're calfskin. Could you show how it doesn't? I think the term you guys used uh, when I visited the factory was break, and explain right. what that means. Well, I should interrupt you because yeah. Horween has a specific trademark on genuine mm -hmm. Horween shell cordovan. There mm -hmm. are other cordovan producers in the world, and mm -hmm. I have their shells. Next time you're in Chicago, I'll show you all the different ones. But okay. it's immediately apparent how how amazing the shell cordovan is from Horween compared to some of the other ones. But uh, anyways. Really? They, no kidding. Right. It's very easily uh, obvious how nice the Horween one is compared to yeah. others. It, how many places in the U.S. produce shell cordovan? One in the U.S. That, that's yeah. that's Horween. 100%. There's only one in the U.S. There's a, a company in Japan that makes some. There's some mm -hmm. in South America, and that's really awful. <laughs> uh, oh. And then there's an Italian guy. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so I have shells wow. of each of those, and they're just not nice. But yeah. uh, it might be hard to uh, translate over the internet here, but the cordovan is, is – think about if this was a shoe, and when your foot flexes, the um, – the way that the leather creases where your toe meets like the body of your foot, uh, mm -hmm. that's where the point of most uh, pressure is happening on the leather. And on a piece of cordovan, when you flex it like this, you never get any creasing. And that's because of that dense it's fiber amazing. layer underneath the skin that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. what's happening with a poor break type of shoe or type of leather is the grain layer is actually delaminating from the fiber structure of of the side so really you're right it, so it's um wow. because there is no grain layer there is no opportunity for this to delaminate and cause that sort of pebbling creasing look right and i, I it, for the viewers my video is going to be tiny but here's an alan edmonds shoe and cask and what he's talking about is is right there and once you w once you get an idea of what shell like i don't own and by the way Myself, I don't own any shell cordovan shoes that I can wear. I've handled them, polished them, you know, found some, you know, at the thrift stores for four dollars, and you know what I mean. Uh, probably one of the best, you know, deals is I found a pair of shell cordovan Aldens for like eight dollars and sold them on eBay for like a hundred and nine. That was kind of fun. But well, I got I never, a dirty, you know, I have a dirty secret too because I actually don't own any either. Uh, they're just yeah. so I can't afford them. <laughs> but uh, I do end up borrowing them from uh, the Horwings. Yeah. They're awfully nice to let me borrow those from time to time. It, but. And Florsheim back in the day, you know, 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I think into the 90s, made shell cordovan shoes. But you can, once you ha understand what it looks like, it's very easy to spot. And you can tell, I've, I've myself personally, I've probably messaged, I think, six or seven different eBay sellers on eBay just when I was browsing for things that were selling shoes that were clearly not shell cordovan, you know, right. and stopped those deals. You know, it's like I was nice and polite about my, okay, listen, that ain't shell. It wrinkles. It has wrinkles on the vamp. It's not shell. Right. You know. you know what? Florsheim is actually a real interesting story. And I wrote a, a blog article on this about a year ago. But they're located in Chicago as well as Horween is located in Chicago. And Florsheim was actually one of the they – were, they were a massive footwear company in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we like to – we don't have documents of this event happening. But we like to imagine – and you got to think about 100 years ago where cars weren't really a thing. I. I right. like to imagine the concept of the original Horween. His name his name was Isidore Horween, the founder of the tannery. I like to imagine him taking a horse and buggy across town to the Florsheim factory, which is still there, by the way, the building's there, and trying really? to show them wow. how great this leather was. And one of the things I imagined him doing was that demo of the creasing and how it doesn't crease. Can uh, you try to show that? Can you try and put it like horizontal to the screen a little bit and try and maybe get it close? I don't know if this is going to show I through mean, on the screen. I could, well. I could ball this up like this. <laughs> and it, it will it will kind of look funky, but it never delaminates. So you always will be able to get that perfectly smooth, no creasing look back. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure how that's translating on here. The other yeah. thing that they used to demo that's totally hilarious is uh, a lot of people smoked back then. And... Uh, cordovan is actually quite breathable and porous. So what they would do is they would take a draw off the cigarette and then blow it straight through the shell to give it a demo of how nice it really? would be. Really? No kidding. Foot. Right. So huh. th that combination of factors makes it possibly th the best choice for dress shoes, definitely, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And I suppose it's I also some, subjective. I, but. I read something that some uh, um, company, DuPont or somebody, 3M or somebody, produced a material that looked, felt, worked like shell, but it was not breathable and people's foot would sweat to death and it was terrible, right? Was that, were you re reading something that I wrote? Because that's all. <laughs> I think so. I think it was something here. Yeah. That's exactly the story. Because And the, the tannery was horrified with when, I believe it was 3M. It might have been DuPont. Mm -hmm. But they came mm -hmm. up with a material that had the same characteristics. It didn't delaminate and crease. It had a bright, shiny luster. But the problem was, is that I bet you they dipped it in tar or something like that. So it was completely okay. non-porous. And it was basically just like putting your feet in a balloon all day or something. You know, there's right. no air movement or airflow. So you just have sweaty feet. <laughs> must right. Which I, I think most people don't think about things like that. Here's right. one of the reasons, by the way, uh, um, that, Phil, I wanted to talk to you. So Phil saw one of my videos. Um, it, 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 I'm trying to, okay, whether people believe it or not, I'm trying to base my YouTube channel on integrity, okay? It's one of my founding 
values that I believe in. So like, for example, I've used Kiwi leather lotion and I've said, why do I use Kiwi? Because I have it and it's worked, you know, and I can't tell you it's good, or great or the best as I, you know, and Phil, what he did was he reached out to me and sent me for free here. Uh, let me put it right way up. I don't know. You probably can't see it there. The video is so small, right? But it's Tanner's Blend Leather Cleaner and Conditioner, Ashland Leather. Okay. And by the way, so this is my first after what, two and a half years of YouTubing about shoes, this is my first official actual perk, okay? After about 480,000 <laughs> video views total combined on all my videos and probably 50 videos, I got a perk, you know? So this, this is worth cool it for, for a me, $20 but... bottle of lotion. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's the reason I reached back out to you and want to do this, okay? Now, just let me back up a second. Who is Bob? Uh, other than a shoe nut, an enthusiast, and a dad, okay? This is not my living YouTube. I, you know, As of this time, I haven't made a nickel off of YouTube. It's not why I do it. It's just a cool, fun hobby. I love teaching. My background is I have a degree in mechanical engineering technology, um, and I worked in the engineering field. I no longer do. I work in finance now, but I worked in engineering for over a decade. And I worked on cars, you know, so I've worked with natural materials. And like uh, the example I, I talked to Phil was, you give me this, the chances are very low that I could put this lotion on a piece of leather at one time and say, oh my gosh, it's unbelievably better. It's like, we'd well, have to put this on a pair of shoes over and over and expose it to the elements and then wait a decade to see if it failed. You know, it's, but when I was dealing in cars, you know, there was like the, the uh, 90s, late 90s when I was doing it, the PPG paint was like the top of the line and it was much, it was double the cost of the other stuff. But once you understood the mechanics of rust, and, you know, metal rusting here in Northeast Ohio, you know, and then, oh, PPG makes an epoxy primer. You know, it's epoxy based. It's going to adhere better than metal. Once I understood how the process, the material broke down and what went into the paint to put on it, then I felt like I could make an intelligent decision. That's why I want to talk to you, Phil, because you work in the industry. You know how leather is constructed. Um, maybe one of my first questions for you is, can we even go back a step outside of Shell Cordovan? Leather, all leather basically comes from the skin of an animal, right? Right. That's Correct right. me if I'm wrong. Tanning is the process by which a chemical process occurs and additives are added into the leather to convert the skin that will degrade and rot into what we call leather, correct? That's right. So the way I like to think of it is there's actually two steps of the main part of tanning but there's mm -hmm. many steps and horween actually happens to do all of the steps so we take a rawhide and and at the end of our process you'll get a finished piece of leather that's not a finished shoe that's not a football that's not a baseball glove it's a sheet of leather so we start with the hide mm -hmm. we end up with a sheet of leather but what's happening the biggest function of a tannery is to take something that is infinitely variable like an animal hide and turn mm -hmm. it into the same thing every time so what we do mm. is that we actually remove the hair and we preserve the hide that's sucking out all the fats that are going to rot and deteriorate and turn into dirt eventually and then later we replace those fats in a process called retanning um, to make the leather look good feel good and smell good and also so mm. it doesn't crack and um break essentially when mm -hmm. when you go to fold it or make a shoe or turn it into anything so we're taking out the fats that are bad or will rot and we're replacing them wow. with okay. nice greases oils and waxes that look good feel good smell good smell like leather um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's quite a bit more to it than that, but that's the way I like to simplify it down is we're, we're curing it and, and making it flexible. Okay. Because, you know, a lot of what I talk about on my shoe channel, you know, the shoes on my channel here, you could go buy a $40 shoe, you know, you could go buy a, um, a $40 shoe um, and, you know, then you look at an Allen Edmonds shoe for 400 you know, and to be quite frank, it, it's sometimes kind of difficult you know, to really understand the difference, you know, and I granted there is shoe construction, but a big part of it is the material as well. Right. You know, so I think that's one of the key things, you know, because a lot of the shoes you buy aren't even leather, you know, they take vinyl, I don't know what they are, and, you know, they emboss on it this, uh, you know, imprint that looks like leather. Right. You know, well, that's so. the other, that's the other thing that's really interesting to me is before I started working at the tannery, I did had no concept that there were multitudes of types of leather themselves, not just that the mm -hmm. animal type, but also the tannages. So when I mentioned the the base tannage where we're sucking out the fats, there's many of those tannages. And then on top of each of those, I call that the canvas. On top mm -hmm. of that canvas, we can do something, the retannage, where we're putting in more fats. 
There's many right. types of retanages. So there is a different retanage for the football leather we make. There's a different retanage for the Chrome Excel leather we make. There's a different retanage for every leather. And on top wow. of all that is there's different finishing processes that we can do for each of those tanges. So there's there's literally an infinite amount of leather varieties in the world. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that uh, nobody really knows about them. And th I think that's okay. Um, there's just, it's such an abstract concept to be able to explain to somebody that's not a tanner uh, mm. how to distinguish the difference. But I want to say this is really important. Uh, I'm, I am completely biased. Uh, I think Horween's <laughs> products, I, I think the leathers that they make are right. absolutely amazing. But well, that's by not the way, to they say are known other for tanneries. extremely high quality. You know, not like you're talk talking out your rear end with nothing to back it up. All Allen Edmonds shell cordovan shoes are stamped with that Horween genuine shell cordovan stamp. So, you know, they're advertising on every shoe. They only use your guy's shell cordovan. You know, you're the only place in the U.S. that makes it. Um, and, you know, from what I saw in touring the factory, you guys don't try to compete on price. Your product is higher priced and you guys don't apologize for it, right? That's right. I mean, and it's amazing. I'm sure you may have got a sense of it, but I call Horween a, mu a working museum. And it's mm -hmm. absolutely true. We have machines there that have been in continuous operation for the last hundred years. And it's, most it, of the it process, was an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a bizarre. That. It's like going to the Field Museum here in Chicago, just looking at all the, these relics. But somehow but it, we've maintained them and you know we still use it every day. By the way, here's something else. I was there in Chicago. I only basically put two and two together the morning I was there. I was there for a business trip. Not I didn't go there to visit you guys, you know, because, you know, I'm in Northeast Ohio. And then I was there on a client appointment. And the client had a pair of 20-year-old shell cord of an Allen Edmund McNeil's. And he goes, really? by the way, you know, yeah. And he goes, by the way, you know, Horween is here. I'm like, okay, it's like nine in the morning. We're going to be done by 1030. My meeting's at one o'clock. If I skip lunch, I could visit Horween. And it was like literally last minute i've seen a lot of being an engineering consultant and you know talking to people in finance i've seen a lot of corporate cultures i got a phone call back i called that day i was there didn't get a hold of the owners the, the secretary sent my phone call upstairs to the owner nick horween i think yeah right? did you talk to nick <laughs> no oh. he didn't he was out or something but i got the tour anyway i just showed up i literally walked in i walked to the shipping dock and like hey the guy walked me in. There was this guy. Phil was there, and he took me around. You know, like completely. Or John, John Lonnie took you around. I'm yeah. sorry, John. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, but I did get a call back from Nick then a few days later. I was like, everything that I saw told me that this uh, is a family atmosphere where everybody is focused on getting the ball in the end zone. You know. Um, and doing it the right way with the right process, rather than what I see a lot of corporate cultures is they're focused on the profit. And when you make profit the focus of a business, my experience is you will step on people to get a profit. You know, when you make serving people the end goal of the business, you should make a profit, you know, well, but it's a should, longer road to hoe. You but you'll know. do it in a sustainable way and you'll right. be able to go to bed, put your head down on the pillow and feel good about what you do. Well, that's how you last 113 years, right? But you should yeah, know well, that the area that the, the Horween Leather Tannery is in right now that you visited, that mm -hmm. was all tanneries way back when and in fact oh, wow. um, my business partner dan worked at a uh, separate tannery across the river from horween until that business went away and now it's a construction office or actually they're mm -hmm. a logistic office now but that whole area i think there were about 150 leather tanneries in chicago at one point as a uh, sort of a supplement to the meatpacking industry where they had all these extra hides and Back then, they had trains to get stuff around, but it was much more efficient efficient to build a tannery next to the the stockyard. Mm -hmm. So, there's a long wow. history of uh, leather in Chicago, and and Horween is the last one. Now, could you talk about for a second what are the top three ways that if you were running a cheap tannery where you didn't care about the longevity of the product, it, not just specific to shoes, but maybe the conversation is more biased towards leather for shoes. How would you cut corners to save money on the leather material if you didn't care about longevity? You just want to lower the price per square foot. Well, the biggest thing that, I mean, that's a tough, tough question. But the biggest thing that Horween does that I wouldn't do if I was trying to make the cheapest thing is I would maximize the leather for yield because we sell leather by the square foot. Mm -hmm. So it, the more square feet I get out of a hide, the, the more money I make. So um, typically... Uh, Hides will get roughly 50 to 55 square feet per hide 
at Horween, we get about 36. So wow. there's okay. quite a big difference. And and the biggest thing is, is there's a couple ways that that's uh, we're not getting a large yield that result in a better product. So what you can do is if you're a cheap tannery, you can have a tanning process that lets out the skins. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it makes them longer and, and wider, but it also happens to thin them out quite a bit. So it lays them out oh. like longer and think of a bath. Like if you were to mm -hmm. lay it out longer in a bath, uh, it, it sort of fills as much as it can. Where at Horween, we're actually plumping up the leather, which gives the leather a, a better break. Um, so that's one thing that we do. And hang we on also, a second. You, sure. Hang on. You said gives it a better break. So what that means is when it does wrinkle, it, 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 it reacts in a more favorable fashion, right? Right. And gosh, it's hard. It's we, we pretend that it is objectively better, but a lot mm -hmm. of people don't know and don't care. We happen to be snobs about break at the tannery, so we really pay attention uh -huh. to that. And there's different types of Well, there is a difference. Breaks, but, yeah, right. Because here's a, here's a floor shine shoe, and from looking at this, and it's a you know, quarter of in color, um, this shoe was probably made in the 2000s. To me, it's very clearly corrected grain leather. And yeah, I, I know you can't see here. Maybe I'll edit in a video. But when you bend it, the way it creases right there, it's very different. The leather is a very different look and feel than the Allen Edmonds shoe. And this cheaper type of leather, I've seen it over and over and over and over right here, right? When this stuff fails, it'll develop cracks right here. You know, it's just, it's difficult to describe, but it, it, there is a clear difference between high and low quality leather and it's longevity. That's the, the easiest way to spot a poor quality leather is what you see is, is there's so much finish covering up. And that's another thing is we use better hides An, a poor tannery will use terrible hides with a lot of natural imperfections, which are fine. But mm -hmm. what they end up doing is they cover it with so much finish that at the end of the day, it's right. it's more finished than leather. So at Horween, right. we, we tend to make um, more aniline type leathers, which means we're just using straight dyes as opposed to pigments. Mm -hmm. And that's aniline. analogous. Right. And that word is A-N-I-L. -A -A, hang on. A-N-I-L-I-N-E is how that's spelled, right? Right. And that's, okay, yeah. uh -huh. that's kind of a, a tough word too, but the way I like to think of aniline leather is like looking at wood. So if I took mm -hmm. a piece of wood right now and I, I hand stained a, a stain on it as opposed to mm -hmm. brushing some paint on it, that stain would be analogous to an aniline finish, whereas a paint mm -hmm. that covers up all the grain, you can't really see through the paint. That is more of a pigmented type of finish. And, and, I, and again, maybe I'll cut in a video here, but it, it is so clearly, if you saw these two things in real life, it's very, very clear. The floor shine shoe, you're seeing one color. It's perfectly smooth. It looks like paint. I don't know what it is, but it's, you know, we're here with the Allen Edmonds shoe, the full grain leather, aniline leather. You can see the tiny microscopic pores, wrinkles, right. imperfect. It, it looks like an animal. Yeah, and, and it, so for me, it's, for me, it's like, why even call it? I think people will do that high amount of finishing on a piece of leather to sell it as leather. But to mm -hmm. me, it's like, might as well just not even use leather. Just use something else, you know? It's, right. It kind of right. defeats the purpose to me. But uh, again, right. like, it's hard for me to sort of poop on this stuff because I think I think it's all good. I mean, I think everybody should like everything that they do like. And mm -hmm. just because uh, I'm a snob doesn't mean that I'm I'm right. I just like I know right, too much right, about right, it right, right. that I, well, I think it actually well, makes it worse for me to live in, in the world because I am always judging leather goods. So when my wife brings yes. me home a Louis Vuitton bag, she goes, oh, what do you think about this leather? I go, <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, it's not. I mean, I can't. It's hard. It, it's hard because it's mm -hmm. it's honestly subjective. Right. Yeah. Well, so um, first, when I started to learn about this, I'm like, oh, full grain aniline leather is the only way to go for shoes. I have a video. Uh, um, uh, what is it called? Restoring a terribly salt stained pair of J&M's Johnson and Murphy shoes. So what I found out, though, was like this guy at our office, you know, was not into wearing over boots, you know, and we get, you know, salt and they plow the streets and salt them here, you know, in, nor in northeast Ohio. And so he wore them out without over boots on and got salt water into the leather. So mm -hmm. one thing I figured out is, is now correct me if I'm wrong, the corrected green leather, because it has this coating, is more water, not, well, I shouldn't say as much water, like chemical and oil resistant. Is that a fair statement? 
I, I it have seems to, to be. It takes longer for the stuff to penetrate into that. I temple. think that would be a safe assumption, but I'd have to know mm -hmm. a little bit more about what they actually put onto their onto that finish mm -hmm. system. It's hard to know, right? But that right. that would make well, logical sense. You know, I should tell so, you. Yeah. I should tell you with the with the salt thing, and I actually I think I skimmed your your salt stain video, but mm -hmm. what's it's really interesting is. You can treat the leather like you would treat your skin, like your hands. You mm -hmm. can wash the leather. You can wash your shoes with soapy water. But mm -hmm. the consequence like of that saddle is... saddle soap? Saddle soap I've had good success with, but I've actually surprisingly had really good luck with just dish soap. Wow, um, okay. But, but the, it's very important to be aware that when you're putting the soap into the leather... And saddle mm -hmm. soap has a little bit of nourishing fats in there too. Mm -hmm. But when you're putting um, soap on there, you're pulling out those fats, similar to the way that we did in that initial tanning process uh, mm -hmm. where we're removing fats that are going to uh, rot. Uh, when you put the soap on the leather, you're pulling out those same sort of nourishing oils. And it's like when you have dry skin. You know, you kind of want to put a little bit of hand Makes lotion sense. on it. And and lubricate the fibers of the skin a little bit so you don't have any uh, potential cracking or even dried out look. So that's where the tanner's blend comes in. So the best results that I've had- Which is, so what we're talking about here is this, the tanner's blend versus what you'd pick up at the store for a few bucks, right? I mean, and they're all good. I mean, I think people should try them all. Well, I mean, don't be too humble about it though. I mean, I, I don't know, just, the way you talk, you know, I mean, I, to be frank with you, haven't even used yours yet, but I have to believe that with experience and where you're coming from, and what was your part in creating this, though, by the way? This is your product? Or are you part of the... That is my product, but my mm -hmm. part in creating it is only marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought it was my coworker, Chris Kolblinger, he's the fifth, he's a fifth generation tanner. His family wow. comes a long line of tanners, and he's the tanner at Horween right now. He developed that conditioner and presented mm -hmm. it to us at work and i said you know we should package this and sell it and he said okay so we partnered with chris and uh now we have our own little uh conditioner and it's amazing it's an amazing product it's, it's well, what's it, in it i mean without getting too technical or secret giving away secrets the only the only thing that i know and i think that's all that is in it is lanolin and lanolin derivatives so mm -hmm. it's basically just pure lanolin in that too oh wow Mm -hmm. So it's a really good, it's it's sort of a neutral smelling. It's not too animally smelling, um, mm -hmm. but it's a really good sort of neutral conditioner. And it happens to work really well with Horween's high uh, oil and grease content leather. So I it's love it. It's not a particularly strong smell. It's a mild smell. Right. But what you it know, doesn't really cool. do that a lot of other products will, I don't think mm -hmm. that that particular Kiwi will do this, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of other uh, products that you'll see are more for polishing a luster. This is not about uh -huh. that. This is about retaining the oil content in in the skin, so it doesn't crack or dry out. But it also has some cleaning characteristics. But um, so uh, I'm guessing that anytime you wash, whether it's saddle soap or dish or whatever you wash your leather with, after using that and after letting it dry, this would be an ideal time to use this, right? And again, yes. it's the point of this so the viewers are clear. I'm not pushing your product, even though I would want people to get it. I want to understand this, what it does. I want to understand, again, the mechanism right. of failure so I can treat it. Right. So what I don't sell is like a luster polish. This one is for mm -hmm. conditioning and restoring. We've had really, uh, we've had people that have an, had amazing luck restoring antique furniture. I think I had mentioned to you in a phone call that we had. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my friends actually restored oh, yeah. a leather ottoman, and it, it's you know a 60-year-old ottoman that was just completely neglect, neglected, looked like it was cracked and dried out. They put a little bit of the tanner's blend on, and it looks brand new. It looks amazing. Wow. So it's yeah. really good at breathing the life back Any, in. Anytime you have an old pair of shoes that are just dried out and you're not sure, I mean, just for re-moisturizing, right? Now, if I were to wash shoes with saddle soap, should I do it right after? Should the I wait a day? Soap, the saddle soap has some built-in um, restoring mm -hmm. fats. Yeah. Um, but it, the big thing is if you don't use saddle soap and you want to try mm -hmm. the dish soap way, which mm -hmm. is what I do, the mm -hmm. very important thing to remove salt stains is to let it air dry. And I'm not sure mm -hmm. the, the chemistry mechanism for why this is happening. I asked the, Chris, the tanner, uh, and he said it's very important to let it air dry. Don't expedite it by mm -hmm, putting it through mm -hmm. a blow dryer. Don't put it in any heat. Let it air dry. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that he's saying that lets the salts release from the, the skin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. And then so um, so let's say somebody has salt stains on their shoes. So however they wash them, then let them air dry. 
So how long should they wait just until it's visibly dry or do they have to wait like 24 hours or the next day? About 12 hours. I, bo- 12 I would hours? say about okay. 12 hours. Just overnight. Okay. Okay. Gotcha, There's gotcha. always There is always a bit of moisture in every piece of leather, no matter what. Mm-hmm. So you'll never get it to 0% moisture. Mm-hmm. Nor do we want to. Probably not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, video's freezing up here a little bit, but uh, hopefully yeah, uh, it's going to pick back up. Um, so that answers that answers. So what about shell cordovan? Does it require more care, less care? It seems like it's pretty durable and requires less care. I'd say less care just because mm-hmm. it doesn't tend to dry out because there's a high concentration of those natural greases, oils, and waxes in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I lose you, Bob? Are you still here? Uh, I can still hear you. Yeah, the video is frozen, but yeah, same. Um, but what's interesting about cordovan is because we don't have that grain layer of structure, we have the shell membrane, which is actually about a millimeter thick, depending mm-hmm. on the shell. Um, when you scuff and scratch a piece of shell, you can actually fill that scratch back in, uh, which wow. is a, a very unique feature to this leather. And uh, I've had good luck with just taking the backside of a spoon and, and rubbing out a crease. Wow. and the leather um and it actually tends to smooth it right out it's it's actually kind of an amazing parlor trick. Mm-hmm. right okay wow that's pretty amazing um so i i think we could talk forever about uh, um you know kind of kind of keep this um to a narrowed subject and try not to overload people as well what should we be looking for again let's keep it narrowed more for shoes um if we want high quality leather you know i mean the the main thing i think i do is look for that full grain aniline leather you know and it's hard, that's a tough question for me to answer mainly because i'm biased but also because it's subjective um i would say that people should go to a brand that they they know is reputable and that they have heard of before and have had people recommend them to. So whether that's Allen Edmonds, like you've been mentioning, I also think Alden makes an amazing shoe. I think Viberg makes incredible boots and shoes. Uh, there's a company called White's Boots that makes great stuff. Wolverine makes, there's so many great brands that make amazing things. And to me, the biggest part about picking the best leather is what do you think looks good? Um, but also I want to throw myself out there is if people want to talk about options that they're seeing just come ask me and just email me at phil at ashlandleather.com and i'll be happy to advise you on on whatever you're choosing from um, but i think this is safe to say that i think there is something worth sharing here right um you know you definitely understand this is exactly what i was hoping that i was going to get was somebody that knows how leather is made because it is again it's probably if you don't know what you're looking at I think it's one of the most, um, not deceptive is not the right word I'm looking for, uh, dark secret materials. You know, like I said, uh, you know, uh, you know, some shoe that's $40 and then you have one that's $800 and, on a, you know, a quick glance, they look similar, you know, and, or maybe you have a $200 shoe that is good. You're welted, you know, versus a $700 shoe. And, you know, you're looking at them like, why should I pay more? You know, I mean, again, we don't have enough lifetimes to say, well, I'm going to buy it, wait 10 years, you know, then find out that I wasted my money I could have had. You know, we need to shorten that learning curve. And this is exactly what I was hoping would happen. Right. You know, because I think you understand just... the process. You know, yeah. you can't, it's one of those things, it's like food. You can get, you know, very cheap food that's full of, you know, nasty things and, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, preservatives and stuff, you know, and like my mother, you know, is a, an amazing cook. My mother's 84 years old. Um, and she quit mowing her own grass. I think she was 79, you know, oh my gosh. and, you know, she can still <laughs> jump rope at 84 years old, you know, Unbelievable. And, really, and I really believe, and I, I'm certain that one of the big reasons for that is because almost everything that she ate um, you know, it was something that she prepared from ingredients, you mm. know, and whole foods, um, you know, and things like that, you know, and, and lean, you know, leaner meats and not tons of meat and very low amounts of process. But the point is, you can look at food and see the ingredient list. You can't do that with leather. And I think that's right. probably one of the most fascinating things about this is, uh, you know, like, what are you getting? And, and, and then how do you care for it? You know, and what are you doing with it? And when should it be used? Because so much what I see on the Internet is conjecture. You know, so it's like you get a little bit of information. You hope that this guy on style form is really right because he sounds good. 
you know, a little bit of scientific information because I have a little bit of an engineering background, you know, and then you follow some people who are experts and they've had good success, but it's still a lot of it is a guessing game. You That's know, right. But um, I mean, like we're not going to talk about it today, but I brought like, you know, my stash of sapphire, you know, like they have the sapphire cream polish. Uh, you know, this I haven't even used this yet. And what is that this? neutral? The, the uh, this is the um, what is this? This is the is that the cordovan cream. The, no, this is the cordovan cream. This is for the um, this is for calf skin. But this is the moisturizing cream they have. Or is it the cleaner? Renovator, the Renovator. That is a really nice. Um, that's a really nice Cleaner product. Conditioner, you know. Yes. Um, uh, you know, and we talked a little bit about like the kiwi, you know, versus. Hey, here's another thing that I've used quite a bit. That's Renomet is raised. very cool. It's yeah, very cool. this this to me is a cleaner. Is what I use this for, right? To clean off uh, old polishes and you know things off of the surface of leather. I've seen um, pairs of shoes that people have worn where their kids got a hold of some crayons or markers, and the Renomet mm -hmm. cleaned it right up without ruining yeah, the finish. It's it's a yep, really absolutely. that's a really special product. Yeah, it works very well. It does take some elbow grease. Um, I did a video recently. I found a pair of Allen Edmonds um, at a thrift store. Um, I forget what date they were. I think that based on the logo, I think the newish they could have been was 36 years old. Um, and they were just just caked on. And you, they, they looked cracked like alligator skin. But mm. from looking at it, I knew it was the finish, you know, what was on the finish, not the leather. Mm -hmm. And you use that. And it took some elbow grease, but I stripped it all off. And they looked not new, but they looked pretty darn good, you know, when they were done. So Right. But it, it did. It took off everything on top of leather without touching the leather or the finish on the leather itself. So, yeah. Well, I think this is the start of a really cool uh, partnership here because uh, yeah. oh, I yeah. tend to know a little bit about Horween or a lot about Horween and a little bit about leather, but you yeah. know a whole lot about shoes. So in collaboration, I think we could learn a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I think this will definitely my goal always with my videos and uh, um, I think I kind of intrinsically knew this Gary Vaynerchuk, social media guy for Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, if you watch him, anybody out there, if the F word offends you, don't watch him. He's you know horrible with his language. But he has a really good point. He says, you never focus on getting people to like your videos or your posts. You focus on content. You know, and I've always, um, and what I'm doing here, I don't try to go wide. I don't try and be an expert on everything. You know, I'm pretty narrow, but what I am talking about, I try to drill way deep down on so people get a good understanding. And you know, that's been my goal to bring people value. And I think this will be some some good stuff here. So Yeah, absolutely. Cool. cool. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. All right. I'm, yes. All right. Thank you so much, Phil. I'm gonna let's chat again. Let's chat again this weekend. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs>